Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to the second lecture in the Fungus Among Us lecture series. My name is Quinn, and I'm a senior majoring in renewable materials, and I'm one of the Oregon State College of Forestry ambassadors. Hi, everybody. My name is Kelsey, and I'll be co-hosting this lecture with Quinn this evening. I am also a student in the College of For Forestry studying tourism, recreation, and adventure leadership, and I am also a College of Forestry ambassador. It's great to have you here with us this, with us this evening. I'm going to pass this back off to Quinn to start off our lecture. Thanks. Um, before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampinafu Band of Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, the living descendants of these people are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. And with that, we can go ahead and get started with our lecture. Um, today, we'll be talking about the science and future of psilocybin-assisted therapy as a treatment for mental health disorders and the recently passed Oregon Measure 109. We will have presentations from three wonderful speakers. First, we will hear from Drs. Dan and Kim Golitz, followed by Brock Bender. Dr. Kim Golitz received a PhD from Vanderbilt University and has built her career combining clinical work and teaching. Her areas of specialty are psychological assessment and psychotherapy for children and families. She has taught courses at University of Washington, Oregon State University, and Linfield College. Dr. Gullitz has maintained a long-standing interest in altered states of consciousness and believes psychedelics have the potential to improve the efficacy of psychotherapy and to address some of the most challenging issues in mental health today and she hopes to be a provider of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy as well. Dr. Dan Gullitz received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Washington in 1996. He has been a licensed psychologist in Oregon, working in private practice since 1998, and is the co-owner of Peak Psychological Services located in Corvallis. His specialties include treatment of anxiety, depression, PTSD, chronic pain, and adult ADHD. His latest passions include psychedelic science and pain science. He has a strong belief in the potential for psychedelics to improve mental health care, foster personal growth, and promote the gen general welfare of humanity. And before our presentations begin, we just want to say please type any questions that you have in the chat because we will have some time for a Q&A at the end. And if, you're pre if your question is intended for a specific panelist, please include that in your question. And with that, will you join me in welcoming Drs. Dan and Kim Gullitz? Hi, thank you for having us today. And uh, we're gonna share our uh, screen here, share the slideshow in just a minute. And Kim and I are going to trade off. She's gonna start, then I'll take over, then she'll take over, then I'll take over, okay? So. All right, and let's see. Yeah, okay. So you just put the. Thanks for having us. It's really nice to be able to talk with you um, about psychedelics and specifically about psilocybin and about changes that are coming our way here in Oregon. As I'm sure you know, psilocybin and other psychedelics have been used beneficially by other cultures all over the world for hundreds if not thousands of years. In, in many ways, we're just another culture trying to figure out how to use these substances for our benefit. And we owe a debt of gratitude and a sense of responsibility to the people who came before us. Western interest in these substances uh, kind of came in waves. Early interest came from anthropologists who were 
discovering, if you want to say it that way, finding other cultures and re um, You're muted. Okay. okay, is that better? How much of that did you hear? Western interest in psychedelic substances kind of came in different waves. So the first wave was anthropologists who were studying other cultures and realizing they had ceremonies and rituals around substances that were an important aspect of their cultures and had some real benefits. The second wave of research, it, the second wave starting in 1940 to 1970, focused more on research than anthropologists studying cultures. They were trying to collect some uh, more concrete information about psychedelics. It became possible when psilocybin and LSD were synthesized by Sandoz. And Sandoz was more than happy to provide researchers with the psilocybin as long as they were willing to write up their results. Most of that work though was being done by psychiatrists who were using psilocybin and LSD in conjunction with psychotherapy. They weren't using control groups, they didn't have validated measures, they were write-ups of case studies, and so they were of limited use. Um, Timothy Leary was um, at the tail end of that second wave, and um, we could spend a lot of time talking about Tim Leary. Um, he did some great work. He gave us really important concepts like set and setting, which are instrumental in doing um, work with psychedelics, where um, set is the, or uh, set is your mindset, expectations you have for the experience, the psychedelic experience, and setting is the place that you're in both physically and uh, socially, the, the interpersonal space, who you're with. This third wave of research, for many of us, kind of came out of the blue. Uh, it started quietly with very little publicity and no fanfare. Research began at really top-notch research institutions and places like NYU and the Imperial College of London starting conducting research. The earliest studies that were done in the, in the beginning of the 90s actually were with cancer patients. So these were people with a terminal diagnosis who had anxiety and depression, end of life distress. Some of them were able to get cancer treatments and buy themselves some more time but then that time that they had at end of life was being consumed with emotional distress. When the researchers approached the FDA to try to get approval for the first studies of psychedelics in decades, they were shocked to find out that the people at the FDA were actually encouraging. They saw that the value that this data had, and the first thing they asked is, uh, well, they said yes, you know, we're going we're gonna, to uh, approve this. And do you have anything for major depression? The fact is, you know, as a psychologist, I believe in mental health treatment. I think it's important and it, it benefits many people. But the tools that we have are not good enough. Major depression, in particular, is a huge problem worldwide. And if you know anyone who has suffered from major depression, you know the treatments are not as effective as we need them to be. And I'm talking about psychotherapy as well as pharmaceuticals. Early studies also uh, addressed uh, smoking cessation. This is another major public health problem. It's very difficult to get people to quit smoking, even though uh, the vast proportion of people who smoke want to quit. And then early studies also focused on treating people for alcoholism. Since the first wave, more and more studies are being approved by FDA. Right now, we have studies going on using psilocybin-assisted therapy to treat anorexia, OCD, headaches, depression that's associated with 
uh, the cognitive impairment of Alzheimer's, social anxiety with folks who have autism, and for other substance abuse disorders. One of the main questions that had to be answered is, what's the safety profile for psilocybin? Turns out psilocybin has an excellent safety profile. The early research was showing no adverse effects. There were some concerns that people might um, have psychotic episodes or become so overwhelmed by the psychedelic experience that they would be in intense psychological distress. That's not what people are finding. Now, a large part of that is because there's they're not taking substances at festivals with um, unknown uh, uh, potency and quantity. They're going through a process where they get um, educated about the process and they're being monitored carefully. So there, there was no need to give people tranquilizers because they were having bad trips. There are some exclusion criteria. So one of the things uh, for people who are participating in the research protocols, they are screening out people who have a history of schizophrenia or other kinds of psychosis. Bipolar disorder is an exclusion um, feature. And then sometimes people who have borderline personality disorder have been excluded from the research. Oh, this is just my picture of um, people. People are concerned about the safety of this. And as I just said, the research is suggesting, you know, we've got a good safety profile here. The people who take psychedelics at festivals take a much higher risk than the people who are participating in these research protocols. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to take over. So Kim, um, just explain to you how there's been a lot of uh, clinical research in recent years showing that psilocybin assisted therapy is helpful uh, for a wide range of mental health problems. Um, on a parallel track, there's also been a lot of research in neuroscience that's been helping us understand how uh, uh, psilocybin might actually work. Um, this figure shows kind of at, at a chemical or molecular level, you can see that um, uh, uh, um, psilocybin, so um, it, it's ingested as psilocybin, the body quickly breaks it down into different components, the, the most important of which is psilocin, it's a metabolite of psilocybin. As it turns out, uh, uh, psilocin very, very closely uh, um, resembles uh, the serotonin molecule. And uh, and so um, uh, and it highly activates the serotonin system, in particular uh, a receptor called the um, serotonin 2A receptor. And I won't go into a lot of detail about that because there's um, uh, not uh, enough time for that. But I'll just say that the serotonin 2A receptor is is particularly involved in processes of of higher cognition thinking, beliefs, learning, uh, memory, and such like that. And in a minute, um, I hope to help you understand why that would be important here. Okay. Uh, this diagram shows, um, th this is a schematic that shows uh, um, uh, brain activity uh, under uh, um, normal and, uh, conditions and under psilocybin. So on the left side, you can see here, um, what, what's characteristic of, of that uh, picture is just kind of how, you know, um, how it's kind of sparse in the middle and um, most of the communication um, between different areas of the brain is, is occurring uh, within the same uh, area or very closely adjacent areas. So that's our normal state or our normal waking consciousness is depicted by the left side of the diagram. <coughs> The right side, however, depicts what brain activity looks like uh, under psilocybin. And as you can see, there's just a lot more intercommunication going on. Um, different parts of the brain are connecting and communicating uh, with other parts of the brain that they don't usually uh, communicate with. 
So there's less order or what psychologists and neuroscientists sometimes call higher entropy, more disorder. Um, um, it, it can be reflected in, in greater chaos, but it can also be reflected in more interconnectedness, more novelty, more, um, more you know, um, variety, okay? And so um, something uh, about psilocybin is bringing that about. Um, how is it that taking psilocybin um, uh, changes these brain activity patterns? Well, that brings us to another, you know, related area of, of uh, neuroscience research. And about 20 years or so ago, uh, some neuroscientists uh, uh, stumbled upon a concept that's referred to as the default mode network. Now, the default mode network is a really important part of how our minds function. Um, uh, it's estimated that we spend up to 60% of our normal, of our waking hours um, in the default mode network process. The default mode network um, has um, a number of different really important functions to it um, that are important for, uh, for daily life. Um, it functions like a mental screensaver. That is, it, it, it becomes active when we're not focusing our attention outside of us. And so that's an important part. When, when we're focused on some task um, outside of us, the default mode network tends to uh, uh, diminish. And another part of our, our uh, brain called the task positive network tends to be in operation. Um, the default mode network is also like our, um, our internal orchestra conductor. It um, regulates and, and, uh, um, and coordinates different aspects of, of our mind so that we uh, you know, pay attention, so that we can plan and organize our activities. Um, it, uh, the default mode network also has an aspect to it that's like a perceptual reducing valve, meaning that there's, um, it, it keeps us focused, you know, it, it screens out uh, a lot of activity that's going on and only allows into our awareness the, uh, the content that is most relevant for our you know, daily functioning. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly for this, the default mode network has been referred to as the ego's address. This is the place where our sense of self resides. This is where our, um, our internal narrative, where our um, our stories about ourself, um, um, how we view the world, um, our, our sense of identity uh, takes place in, you know, the, the default mode network. And as you might imagine, uh, the default mode network would be really hard to, um, you know, function in daily life without because it does so many important things. Unfortunately, over time, um, uh, there's a tendency for all of this, um, this thinking, which we call self-referential thinking, to kind of descend into patterns of, of negativity and, and, and we get stuck in ruts more and more as time goes on. And that occurs simply as a result of, of you know, more experience, um, but as we encounter adversity, as we get negative messaging from our environments, and certainly as we um, experience uh, events in our life that are traumatic, it affects our, um, our, our thoughts, our belief systems. And then as we you know, spend all this time you know, internally focused, we rehearse and rehearse and, 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 and practice all of this negativity until it becomes more and more rigid. Our beliefs about ourselves and the world become more and more set. This leads to patterns of avoidance, and, and that you know, further enhances that, that kind of you know, rigidity and constrained quality. Um, and there's a lot of, of scientific research in psychology that is showing us that um, patterns of avoidance really occupy a very central position in lots of the most common um, uh, mental health problems that people suffer from, including depression, anxiety, PTSD, addictions, and other things. Um, 
wouldn't it be great if we could somehow uh, um, uh, uh, diminish or, or, or get outside of this default mode network, at least for a little while, so that we could see beyond the constraints of these you know, patterns of thinking and feeling and behaving? Well, uh, it turns out that that's pretty much what psilocybin helps us do. And so if we go back to this uh, figure that I showed earlier, let's, let's imagine that it is really the default mode network on the left side that is constraining this, uh, uh, th this pattern of activity, um, almost like you know, a traffic cop sitting right in the middle of the circle, you know, directing traffic to go into you know, old familiar patterns, the way that you know, you're used to being. Um, when you, you know, set that traffic cop aside, um, you get a lot more diversity, a lot more intercommunication. Um, the potential then opens itself up to see outside of, you know, these habitual ways of thinking and, 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 and feeling. Uh, new insights can emerge, new uh, sense of perspective. Um, you know, uh, uh, a larger sense of yourself and your life that isn't so limited by uh, the same old habits. And, and so, so um, psilocybin is like giving your ego a breath of fresh air. Um, it enhances flexibility and creativity. Um, you get a much broader experience of what it's like, you know, to, you know, to, to be you, to think and feel. A lot of that stuff that's always going on in the background that gets suppressed by the default mode network, by your ego, um, it, you, you're allowed to be in contact with it. Now, that can also cut both ways because sometimes there's a lot of uh, painful stuff back there. And that's part of why we want to... Um, do this therapy in, in you know, controlled and, and supportive conditions because sometimes what we access is, is difficult and, and our ego has been suppressing it because it's painful. Um, but even then, it can be really helpful you know, in, in the right kind of environment to be able to work through uh, th those kind of uh, um, uh, um, thoughts and, and feelings. What we've found is that, um, again, flexibility and creativity, um, uh, um, more openness, a um, uh, uh, greater sense of compassion for yourself and others, and just a greater appreciation for life is often uh, uh, the result of uh, um, psilocybin-assisted therapy. And so um, psilocybin-assisted therapy is not like ordinary drug therapy where you take the, you know some drug every day for months or years or the rest of your life just to manage symptoms. The process is designed to be transformational. Um, uh, this therapy typically involves, you know, one, two, maybe three administrations of the drug over a period of several weeks or a few months. Um, so it's not something that goes on and on forever, but it's this, you know, intense um, experience of being uh, um, outside of your, um, you know, typical mental framework that allows you to gain a, a, a fresh new perspectives um, and, uh, um, and greater insight into, you know, your, your own mind and to contact parts of yourself that you've been cut off from. And, the, and then the, the therapy um, continues where you work through uh, um, what you've experienced and Kim's going to tell us a little bit more about that now. All right. So the model for what psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy looks like is coming out of the, the research protocols, the standard protocols that are used. Generally, there are three different components, preparation, drug administration, and integration. Um, Preparation are the therapy sessions that you have before you have the dosing session. And this is a time, you know, it's, it's like psychotherapy, right? So there's going to be getting to know the person's history, um, what their 
uh, what their goals are, what they're hoping to get out of this psychedelic experience, and to provide education so that people know about possibilities, possible experiences. They can be prepared for the difficult times, because there are difficult times sometimes during these experiences. The Drug Administration, typically for psilocybin, is four to six hours. Um, you can see in the picture, this is a picture from uh, one of the research studies. Um, so people are in you know, a nice office, on a sofa, eye shades help you kind of tune inside. And so it, it enhances or deepens the experience of the psychedelic. Often there's music. Um, playing and uh, there sometimes people make their own um, uh, playlists um, in the research protocol every single person gets the same playlist traditionally there have been two therapists in the room um, uh, and it's not clear if that's what's going to be required moving forward but that's the standard protocol now the research protocols typically have one or two administration sessions. Um, again, looking forward at what might be most useful for people clinically, it's, it's possible that people will have multiple drug administrations to get the best results. In the integration section, session, again, it's more therapy. Multiple sessions are usually indicated. And this is when people try to understand the nature of their experience, find insight and understanding, make meaning of the experience that they had. And, and I think this is really important, part of that integration is taking what you learn from that experience and turning it into lasting change. This is what makes it different, I think, from uh, recreational use of psychedelics, where it's almost like a one-off. You know, you, you have an experience and, and maybe it's, uh, it's very valuable or enlightening in some way, but over time, that gets lost. The purpose here is to take insights that you're learning and make lasting change, lasting personal change that goes beyond the experience. Great. Yeah, that's it. All right, so we can both um, talk about this, or you can, you know. Um, so um, as you may know, um, uh, Oregon is leading the way in bringing uh, uh, psilocybin-assisted therapy to the U.S. We had uh, Measure 109, which both Kim and I were very involved in the campaign, and we were you know, super excited when it passed in November. Um, and, uh, and so we can uh, um, say that, that we are on track to, uh, again, you know, be the first in the United States to have a legal uh, psilocybin therapy program that is, um, you know, regulated so that it's, you know, um, safe and effective. Um, and, and we'll just kind of go over a little bit of where we're, we're at now that 109 has passed. Um, uh, just very briefly, who can receive psilocybin services? Well, you have to be 21 um, years of age or older. You can't have any um, uh, um, uh, medical or mental health uh, um, conditions that, that would um, make it unsafe or, or, or you know, cause problems. Um, now, one of the interesting things about 109, though, is that it, you don't have to have a mental health diagnosis. And, and this uh, service is available for people who want to do it for, for reasons of personal growth or self-improvement or spiritual uh, connection. That's allowed, again, as long as they don't have any of those other uh, rule outs. And all of the services have to be done uh, with a facilitator present in a, um, uh, in a uh, licensed service center is, is the is, the, the title that they give to clinics, and there will be a special, a separate license for, for the facility and uh, for the facilitator um, who, can, uh, 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 who can provide. Um, you have to be an Oregon resident um, for at least two years, and you have to be over 21. There is a whole um, uh, process of, of education, training, and licensure examination. Now, Kim 
uh, was appointed by uh, the governor recently to serve on the psilocybin advisory board. Um, uh, um, so there, there's a two year developmental period, even though the measure passed in November, part of the law requires that, um, that there be a two year period during which all of the nuts and bolts are gonna be put into place. So the program isn't uh, available yet because there's lots and lots of details to be worked out. And that's gonna be overseen by the Oregon Health Authority. Uh, the Psilocybin Advisory Board was a special group of people appointed by the governor that represent a broad cross-section of, of knowledge and experience and disciplines. And they're all gonna get together and meet and they're gonna end up providing a set of recommendations to the um, OHA who will then you know, uh, um, determine what the, uh, um, what the specific uh, rules and regulations uh, will be for how the program is implemented. And it's due to uh, um, become active in early 2023. Okay, and that is the end of our prepared talk and, and we're gonna yield the floor, but if people have questions, we can get to those um, later. I will stop sharing, thank you. Awesome. Thank you both so very much. That was very, very insightful and we really appreciate it. That was awesome. Big round of applause for both Dr. Kim and Dan Golitz. So on to our next speaker is Mr. Brock Bender. Brock has been an advocate member of the plant medicine community since 2009 to assist his mother in overcoming life-threatening alcohol and opioid addiction. Brock utilized natural medicines that assist her in becoming opioid free within six months of within a six month program. He leveraged his experience to dive deeper into understanding the underlying mental health crisis here in Oregon and opened up the, the state's 14th licensed medical cannabis dispensary, becoming the youngest dispensary owner here in the nation. Studying agriculture business management and horticulture at Oregon State University. He immersed himself to ensure fair access to cannabis and psilocybin by educating local and federal lawmakers to pioneer opportunities that address mental health and op the opioid crisis that exists today. Now it's my pleasure to pass the stage to Mr. Brock Bender. Hello, hope oh, my mute is unmuted there. Um, I'm gonna take a less traditional approach. I wanted to adapt my presentation to ensure I was uh, talk making talking points a little bit different than um, the Galetzes. So um, I'm excited to present to you. Um, I will disclaim, I am not a medical doctor or psychologist. I am an immersive energy seeker who uh, tries to listen to plant medicine and fungi the best I can to help uh, others and individuals in need. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited that we're having this discussion here today. This is a monumental, um, time in, in our history that uh, has been resurrected, has come forward you know, many times, and I'm hoping this is the, the last time that we have to preach that this is a medicine and uh, not a drug that uh, people should be put behind bars for. So um, again, uh, my name is Brock Bender. I'm the founder and owner of High Quality, the state's uh, or state of Oregon's 14th licensed cannabis dispensary in the very first in Benton County. Um, my why is to provide the tools and knowledge to empower others to take control of their personal uh, health, happiness, and well-being. Um, and I found my why with experiencing life in a world where plant medicine was not an option. So part of my uh, communication today was to kind of do some storytelling um, where I'll be personal about my experiences and the experiences of my mother with plant medicine. And then I'll go into a little bit about uh, Measure 109 and what we might anticipate um, for what the future uh, will look like there. So um, just a brief, my, uh, my mom was born without lower cartilage and, or cartilage in her lower spine. Uh, in order to alleviate the pain endured, she re uh, resorted to her doctor's recommended resource prescription painkillers. Uh, years later, I watched her through an emergency room window after an opioid overdose, unknowing if she'd still be with me the next day. What I did know is if she was, I would do all my power to see that she never had to rely on opioids again. Um, so my mother, it, obviously pain is an epidemic and my belief that in certain circumstances that the pharmaceutical industry was capitalizing on that pain at the expense of our loved ones. So I wanted to figure out how can we use other alternatives to treat pain and illness. Um, and so I became a uh, uh, volunteering at a physical therapy clinic 
um, to recommend programs. I wanted to find another way for rehabilitation. But then I kept finding that when we were doing these, these uh, experiences with, um, with the patients that they were in too much pain to complete the programs. Oh my gosh, you know, there has to be another solution. So um, fortunately what came forward was that in Oregon, at least as in the nineties, we had the Oregon medical marijuana program. And what that allowed us to do was to at least have a identification that says we're allowed to possess uh, certain amounts of cannabis uh, and use that as a medicine. So that was a big change um, for us. And I leveraged that change uh, to be able to help others. And through that process, um, we were able to help expedite the patients that we were working with through that pain um, in 50% of the time that they were used to during the rehabilitation program. So it just sent a message to me that says, you know, if we could, if we could help others using plant medicine, uh, you know, why can't we do this at a grander scale? Why can't we do this even more? Um, and so, you know, through my research of alternative medicine in Oregon, you know, finding cannabis, finding the Oregon Medical Marijuana Program, um, you know, I was able to take this program that I was using with my patients, using it with my mother, and she became prescription free um, within six months of using cannabis. She also got off alcohol. Um, she regained her strength and she had obtained a job for the first time in nearly 20 years. And so I, I grew up in an upbringing where I witnessed this as a child of watching my mom and dad you know, get into arguments, get into fights. And then, you know, it was either over uh, who didn't get the last pill or, you know, who drank the last what. And I, I saw that and never wanted to have anything to do with what came in a bottle. Now, I want to disclaim that I'm not saying that the pharmaceutical industry is, 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 a, is everyone is bad. Uh, there is absolutely a place for uh, the history of plant medicine and modern medicine and Western medicine. Um, it's just that we have a serious issue on our hands that we need to consult, and the mental health crisis is indeed just that. When one in five Americans are experiencing, you know, adversity of whether they're questioning their existence on this on this planet, um, we're just simply putting a bandaid and actually furthering the issue um, by saying, "Here, take these twenty things and call me in the morning and see how you do." So, um, I'm just very excited that we're adding a new tool to the tool cabinet. Um, which is known as psilocybin mushrooms. And, and I say that because I work and I see next to 200 people a day uh, through my retail dispensaries. And I get to see their firsthand experiences in combating uh, their stressors and social anxiety and depression and PTSD. And I can say that cannabis definitely can help you, uh, but it is not an end all be all. Uh, I find it to be something that can, it's, it's a learned drug. And it, you, know, you can get benefits from it the way that you associate your ingestion with it. Um, I'm seeing something very interesting with psilocybin mushrooms that I find are having significantly prolonged effects where you're not dependent on subsequent doses or nightly doses um, to get lasting change. So, um, and I found that because uh, I had my own kind of experience with, uh, with depression. So where where I'm getting into is for the industry of, of cannabis is something that, that will be um, a, a model for us to learn from, but it will not be the future of what we see in, in psilocybin therapy. Now, psilocybin is still a schedule one drug, just like cannabis is. So what that means is, is at least the federal government said, this is a low priority item, but it still means from a federal level that you can be incarcerated for being in possession of this, at least outside of the state of Oregon. Um, so we still have a lot of work to do to proving that we can demonstrate a model that is effective so that we can get these laws and change. Now, however, as soon as, as long as they are, we're still going to have issues like the issues that I incurred. Now, uh, working with cannabis, um, I was unable to take, uh, normal business deductions in my business. So, uh, about three years ago, uh, three or four years ago, I got, uh, an audit from the federal government that said, uh, you will not be able to take normal business deductions and we are going to tax you on everything that you made gross profits. That means you can't deduct anything that you paid for your receptionists, your bud tenders, and you, your, uh, the uh, healthcare that you provide, none of it. Um, so I got slapped with about a half million dollar tax bill and a letter saying, we're gonna seize your assets and you'll never be, you won't be able to leave the country. And I, I think through that experience, uh, I, 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 I I didn't react to that very well. And I wasn't getting out of bed till like one in the afternoon. And I, I didn't want to be around people. A lot of what uh, Dan was describing in, in, in depression. And I, 
I wanted to be someone who helps people. And I didn't think that I, that, how could that get me? Um, but it did. And, and it was having serious implications on, on my business and, and the family and the people that we were around. So I, I reached out to someone and said, you know, what do you know deeper into plant medicine that, that might be able to get me out of this rut? And they turned me on to, to psilocybin. And I had my first experience with that, ingesting it in the form of a, of a mushroom tea. Now, um, again, this isn't done in the clinical, the therapy that, in a therapy environment. I wasn't in Canada or anywhere else where I could do that. Um, but I did do it with the understanding of what um, Dan and Kim described as set and setting. So understanding what is your intention and what is the environment can have a, um, an impact in your experience. And, and I had the intentions of wanting to, to be a better version of myself, of wanting to be able to take problems as opportunities. And I wanted to embrace challenges. I really wanted to seek to get out of the brain, the wavelength that I was in at a low resonance frequency and be at a higher vibrational level so that I could attract others around me and help more people. And so I took a full dose of an eighth of psilocybin mushrooms and a mushroom tea and the effects were profound. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get into the whole thing, but uh, I converted it using lemon juice and uh, that was able to allow me to avoid the upset stomach feeling by converting the psilocybin to psilocin. And, um, and I experienced that over the course of about four hours. Um, and I will say that during that experience, I looked at the, or after the experience, I looked through the, the lens of like a newborn's eyes. Um, I looked at the world completely differently. It was a complete reset, but I won't say that I came out with everything with the knowledge of what to do. I just had simple lessons that were guiding me to, to make a better version of myself. So what I'm saying is I, it took me about a year after that without some sort of other consultation, um, to make meaning of my integration of my experience to really, um, understand what the, the medicine was doing for me. Um, so again, you know, being in that, I was in a scarcity mindset. I was about to give up the company that I had worked my entire life for to help other people. Um, because I'd gotten in within myself so deep that I didn't think I could escape. And mushrooms gave me an opportunity to see the world a little bit differently. And over the course of a year, I was able to make change in my life um, to, to combat that adversity. Um, so uh, what, what, what then further happened when I really knew that there was a change is I, I started microdosing uh, using mushrooms and, and, and they've been a part of my toolbox. But uh, I had another experience where uh, I got a call from the IRS, uh, and they had see they actually had done what they said they were going to do. They, they seized the bank accounts. Good on them. Uh, and I had payroll in about five days. And the difference between me, this was a year after my mushroom experience. And the, the difference I would say of me before was, you know, oh, why is the world happening to me? And and I said I started looking at situations. Oh, this is happening for me. And I just became so solution obsessed versus glorifying the problems. And that just gave me a completely shift in mindset that um, that allowed me to to come out of the depression that I felt like I self-diagnosed myself. Um, so that was a little start to finish of what I love about plant medicine and what it had done for uh, my mother with cannabis, but also how psilocybin therapy uh, has benefited me um, individually to help me to help more people. Um, I think what we're incurring right now is we are trying to catch up, you know, modern science with ancient wisdom. And there's much to be learned in both directions. You know, what we know, uh, there is uh, Dennis McKenna, if anyone's aware of him, you know, he has the stoned ape theory. And he believed that psilocybin mushrooms were the evolutionary catalyst from which language, uh, projective imagination, the arts, religion, philosophy, science, and all human uh, cultural spring. So, it's pretty interesting to imagine a world where is it possible that human evolution um, came from uh, the ingestion of psilocybin mushrooms? That's a fun thing to fantasize about. But then you get into you know the '60s with Timothy Leary and you know how do we use these this mushroom this this fungus uh, and and use it in a way to change the way that we're doing things now? And you know there was the counterculture area that exists in the '70s and it was just it's constantly been suppressed and put under the radar 
um, for I'm sure fear of change and loss of control by the government, my own hallucination. But um, now where we're at is the US Food and Drug Administration that uh, has said that psilocybin demonstrates significant benefits over available therapies. Well, that's change. Um, they granted a breakthrough therapy on se two separate studies, uh, treatment resistant depression in 2018 and uh, major depressive, depressive disorder in, in 2019. Um, so I'm just gonna give, uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that how cool it is where we're at right now, where we are finally at a point where it's being recognized as a medicine and where 109 has coincided with a measure called measure 110, which had decriminalized drugs at the same time that we had uh, legalized psilocybin therapy. So, you know, I'm just going to go over briefly here uh, for just a few minutes to just understand what Measure 109 does not do. Because I think it's going to be easier than trying to understand what it is because there's a big two year rulemaking, rulemaking, process, two -year rulemaking process that's going um, to be birthed here in 2023. Um, so, what we had known is, you know, 109 is a regulatory framework of supervised psilocybin therapy. So, that means that no, you cannot go to a therapy center and purchase or a like a dispensary and purchase it and bring it home with you. So under this model, that is not allowed. However, because 110 does exist, that means that if you are in possession of it, it could just mean that you are going to incur about a hundred dollar fine or complete some drug pre uh, treatment program. Um, we are shifting the model in Oregon to say and look at this that um, people who are in possession of drugs aren't necessarily aren't bad people uh, and that addictions is an underlying onset of mental health um, issues. So we are becoming very progressive and we're going to be investing significant dollars into changing the way uh, that we approach mental health. So um, just want to make everyone aware that when 109 does come, it isn't something that you'll be able to take home with you. However, if you are in possession of it, you won't be treated like a criminal in the state of Oregon. Um, as uh, Dan and Kim had communicated, the, uh, you'll be under the supervision of a licensed uh, facilitator. So uh, there's going to be different license types. Um, if you're looking on the business end of this, you can get up to five therapy centers. You must be, uh, therapy centers must be owned at least 50% or more by someone who is uh, an Oregonian. Um, so there, there's that. Uh, you can get up to one production or processing license, and that is going to have uh, different endorsements uh, that are going to come with that. Um, <clears throat> you're not going to see brands on the psilocybin mushroom products in Oregon. So what you see in dispensaries today, basically everything you see about how we treated cannabis, kind of forget about that. And you're going to see a new model that is therapy uh, produced that is going to be extremely effective because what it's going to do is it's not going to bound. What I love about this measure, uh, thanks to Tom and Sherry Eckert and all the work that they have done and Sam Chapman, is this is going to be widely accessible to anyone who is 21 years or of age or older. So you won't have to demonstrate that I have this condition, therefore I'm the only one, you're, or only these three set conditions. There, that you can get therapy and benefit from this uh, just from being the age of 21 or over and going to a psilocybin uh, therapy center. Um, and I think that's uh, extremely important. What's also is really nice about this is from my perspective, they protected the integrity of the mushroom, meaning that you're gonna be able to ingest something that is the actual form. This isn't a psilocybin mushroom, this is a, uh, an oyster mushroom, but you can actually eat, uh, ingest that instead of just having an isolated form of psilocin. And psilocin in itself is very effective, um, but from what I believe in plant medicine that where certain parts of pharma have gone wrong is that the agenda is to isolate a compound where I think there's something very special about the plant itself that it's bringing forth um, that there's many other parts and components to it um, that give it the benefits that they do. So I'm very excited that we will be able to take part in that. Um, so there will be a license for a facilitator. So for any of you that are also, you know, uh, want to help others as uh, you have the opportunity to take a test and you don't have to have, I think it's just a high school diploma to qualify to be able to, you know, take the test and, and go through that. Um, but to become an actual licensed facilitator, where you'll be able to partner with um, 
a, uh, a therapy center to go and practice these administrations um, for, for patients. And so you'll do the, they spoke about the uh, pre-questionnaire, uh, the license, the, the therapy session, and then the integration must be uh, offered afterwards, um, which I find that to be extremely important and valuable. Um, you won't see, uh, there won't be a homegrown allowance of, of psilocybin. That isn't going to be something uh, that is going to be permitted in the state of Oregon. Um, and again, it's gonna be about two years until we're going to see this come to fruition. So, um, you know, a, a lasting message I have is to attend, you know, what we're seeing like you guys are today um, so that uh, you can stay abroad of what's going on and have your voice heard and speak on behalf of the issues that you're concerned with. Um, much of what has been written isn't necessarily in stone. They're the the, the um, group that Kim is involved with, you know, they're making recommendations um, to the Oregon Health Authority to make laws. So I think that there's possibility there could be subcommittees that make recommendations to them to help them on specific issues that you might be uh, particularly concerned with. Um, so uh, st stay involved, stay active, stay listening and communicate because we have the opportunity today uh, going over the next few years to guide a model that um, is going to quite possibly be the one that the rest of the nation will follow. Um, my, my closing statement is, uh, you know, nature is communicating with us to provide necessary resources Low. to overcoming Battery the human challenges charged. and beyond that exist today. It's our job to adapt and understand this communication and listen so we can leverage the opportunities to take control of our health, happiness, and well-being. Uh, and again, I want to give a really big shout out to uh, Tom and Sherry Eckert. Sherry was one of the, um, the sponsors who, who made Measure 109 happen. And she passed away this last year in December due, due, due to heart complications. So um, she's owed a, a lot of gratitude and, and uh, thank yous for why we're having this conversation today. And then good Sam Chapman as well for being the campaign manager for, for 109. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brock, so much. That was very enlightening and answered a lot of questions that I had about measure um, 109 and 110. Or 110. Um, Thank you again for our guest speakers. Um, thank you, Dr. Kim and Dan Golitz. And thank you, Dr. I mean, thank you, Brock Bender for um, showing up today and giving us our lecture. I also want to thank the participants who showed up for our lecture today. We really appreciate your time um, showing up for that. And I also need to make a shout out to a College of Forestry ambassador team for putting this together and having the idea about um, we asked the students what they wanted to hear. They told us and we're putting this on for them. Um, but now we, what we've all been waiting for is some of these questions we have. So one question I have is, do these studies mainly focus on microdosing or macrodosing to treat the major depression? And are there pros and cons of each? <clears throat> uh, quick answer, the, these studies uh, um, uh, really focus on a macrodosing approach. Um, again, microdosing is, is, is a different sort of a thing, um, and I can uh, um, very briefly, microdosing involves, you know, using very small amounts, and, and you get more subtle effects. You don't get the dramatic shifts in consciousness that you get from a macrodosing, and so it tends not to be so transformative, but, but it can um, affect um, your daily functioning. It's been associated with greater creativity. Um, you know, uh, 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 improved um, um, mood and motivation. Although even then, uh, a microdosing is, is, is a little controversial because we don't have a lot of really good science backing it up yet. It's mostly kind of anecdotal. Awesome, thank you. I know that's been a question that's um, been li widely asked recently. Um, so another question is, does psilocybin change the pattern of intercon interconnectivity after taking it or is it just while taking it? Um, well, uh, um, most profoundly while you're taking it, but that's where the whole uh, therapeutic process uh, comes in. That's the integration is, is really important because it takes uh, the, those insights, that, that experience and puts it to work. There seems to be a window uh, of, of enhanced uh, um, uh, um, neuroplasticity is sort of the term that they use, that where, where the brain is in a more flexible state, more able to, uh, to change, more able to learn and make new uh, uh, connections. And that's why um, 
you know, we think that, that doing integration, you know, shortly after or, or, or woven into the whole process is really important because you want to, so to speak, strike while the iron's hot. Can I just say, there's often a metaphor used to, that I think addresses this mm -hmm. about the, uh, the sledding down the, uh, the hill. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine standing on a hill, uh, being up on a hill, and people have been sledding all day, and there are ruts from the way people have gone, and you slip into the ruts that are down the hill. A psilocybin experience can be like standing at the top of the hill where no one has skied, no one has sledded down the hill. And so it's, uh, it's all, all options are on the table. All routes of thinking and experiencing are open. It's like a fresh start to be thinking about self and priorities in the world. Thank you. Yes. Um, so our, another question is, if the active ingredient is not isolated, how um, is the dosing consistent? Uh, well, um, I, you know, and, and, and Brock may um, be able to respond to this better than I, but, but, but testing is going to be part of the program. Um, do you want to answer that, Brock? Yeah, uh, I would elaborate further that I didn't mention that type of license type that laboratories will be required um, under this model. And so I'm, uh, I'm interested to see how that, how that'll play a role. You know, uh, the, the like origin of mushrooms, you know, there's different species that we talk about. Um, we talk about strains and varieties of specific mushrooms that we have experienced have been more powerful or more spiritual than, than other varieties. So that we have the up to now, because we haven't been testing, we understand, okay, this variety is stronger than others. And therefore I don't need to take as much, but it, when it comes to consistency, I mean, really the, the outcome here is to get change for the individual and someone's experience is going to be different depending on that individual's chemistry. And so it's going to be interesting to see how different types of therapy um, evolve to allow those to get that lasting change. So when it comes to, again, consistency, um, the, you could say, okay, well, are we just going to give this person a gram or um, is it actually going to be measured by percentage of psilocin? Um, and these are things that I don't think are knowns yet is how we're going to be communicating that consistency um, uh, and, and whatnot. But I, I do think it's exciting uh, that we're going to have the option to have that, um, you know, whether it's in the form of a pill or a gummy or another form of, of concentration uh, there. So. Can, I, can I just say, um, we have a great mycologist on the OHA advisory board, and uh, Jesse Euling is there to help us try to work through this. Yes, we actually had Jesse Uling um, was our first speaker for our first lecture series. So it was like, if you guys haven't seen that yet, you guys can go to our um, Fungus Among Us lecture series page and see that. And this recording will also be up on there. I think it might take us a day or two, but it'll be linked through the College of Forestry YouTube channel. But um, I'm really sorry if we didn't get to all the questions that we had this evening, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I want to give our speakers, Dr. Kim and Dan Golitz and Brock, uh, a round of applause and a big thank you so much for your time. And also so much of what you guys do for our community and advocating for um, the psilocybin therapy and plant medicine. Um, we really do appreciate that. And we are really grateful to have you guys speak with us, speak with us this evening. Thank you for having us. We really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Okay. Also, the third and final lecture of the Fungus Among Us lecture series will be in May, so keep your eye out for additional details to come. <laughs>